Thanks, Aaron. Good morning, everyone. It's great to be here with you all, even in this new format. This panel is going to talk about a topic that's gotten a tremendous amount of attention in recent years, balancing the distributed grid, DERs, and load control. As DERs have become more widespread, the question that many are asking is how we can put them to use in managing the intermittency that comes from greater penetrations of renewable generation, both at the transmission and the distribution level. So this panel is going to speak to some of the good work that's going on in this area. To get us started, I've asked each of the panelists to introduce themselves and their organizations. Um, Brian, would you like to get us started? Thank you, Kristen, and good morning to everyone. Thanks to ETS and Z Prime for, for having us uh, here today to talk about balancing the distributed grid. I'm Brian Hannigan. I'm president and CEO of Holy Cross Energy. We are an electric cooperative of 46,500 member owners based about two hours west of Denver in the mountains of Western Colorado. We serve a very diverse area from the farmers and ranchers uh, of the Western Slope to the ski areas and communities surrounding the resorts in Aspen and Vail. Um, our uh, electric cooperative is very much focused on uh, transitioning to a clean energy future while continuing to provide the safe, affordable, and reliable surface that our consumers in our communities have come to expect. To that end, uh, we've implemented a strategy we call 70-70-30, where we're moving towards 70% clean energy, a 70% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions, all by 2030, with no additional cost uh, in our power supply, which makes up roughly half of our bill. We're proceeding down that path with a lot of success uh, with mostly bulk power resources, but as we anticipate making a journey to 100% clean and sustainable energy, distributed energy resources are gonna be increasingly important uh, for filling in the gaps in our resource portfolio, whether it's rooftop solar, behind the meter storage, electric vehicles, or any of the other new connected devices that we see our consumers adopting, we know that we have to manage and monitor and migrate our distribution system to become more flexible and agile to accommodate all of those new technologies. And I really look forward to sharing with you some of our early successes in that regard. Thanks, Brian. Anna? Yeah, good morning. Uh, my name is Anna Pop, and I am a power system graduate engineer at Austin Energy. Austin Energy um, is a community owned utility. Uh, it's an enterprise of the city of Austin, and um, we are just shy of about half a million customers. We're generally the you know greater Austin area, a little bit outside of it, our territory. And uh, just to speak to a little bit of fusion of my work and um, kind of where we're headed with DER, we just wrapped up um, a multi-year uh, DOE demonstration project called Austin Shines. If you go to my ETS um, profile, you can see that I uh, linked in my contact info, a link to the uh, final deliverable reports that I was kind of the chief editor of. So I would love for folks to go check that out. Um, but now that we're, we've wrapped that up in early summer and um, where we're headed for next steps is gonna be building on assets that we deployed for Austin Shines. Uh, we're gonna be using one of our grid scale energy storage systems to partner with EPRI on um, what's called the SOLAS project. So it stands for Solar Critical Infrastructure Energization. And um, it's a little bit more about responsiveness for um, powering critical systems, uh, using um, developing and demonstrating a process for control system operating, um, solar and storage resources, the grid, um, and a manageable load to sustain you know, a critical infrastructure piece. Uh, we have lots of things, although going across the utility and across the enterprise and different technology groups, which I can speak to a little bit, but um, I am on the DER integration team, and those are going to be our, uh, our next steps and focus going forward. Thanks, Anna. Appreciate that. Last but not least, from Paris, Fred, would you like to introduce yourself? Thanks, Kristen. Yeah, so my name is Fred Vauquier. So I'm the Senior Solution Director for our Renewables and DR Orchestration Solution here at G Digital Grid Software. So G Digital mission is really to transform how industry solves its toughest challenges. And so in the case of uh, you know, the utility industry, the toughest challenges is 
all utilities uh, recognize is really uh, the integration of renewables and DERs. And so the way we are tackling this uh, at GE is really in an end-to-end -end solution, uh, going from the GIS, so geospatial information systems, through the planning, through distribution operations, through transmission operation, market management systems, and analytics. So really across the board. And so very happy to be on this panel today, uh, sharing this with you, Christine, Brian, and Anya. Thanks, Fred. And, and we're going to come back to that word orchestration in your title. We had a nice conversation about that a few minutes ago, so we'll come back to you on that. So just to get us started, why don't we spend a few minutes talking about you all's perspective on the role that DERs are playing today, the degree to which they're actually showing up as a resource that will have heft and weight. Um, and if you don't see that today, in what time frame do you see that showing up as whether it's an aggregated or an individual resource that can actually be leveraged? Brian, why don't you get us started? Sure. So we have seen a tremendous interest in our community with respect to rooftop solar PV. And, and I would say that's probably the, the number one distributed energy resource that we've seen uh, coming onto our system today. Part of that is that we're actively encouraging that as part of our resource portfolio. As an electric cooperative, part of our mission is to help foster economic development and job creation in our communities as well. And one of the ways we do that is by supporting local solar installers, local energy efficiency firms. And so we've taken an affirmative commitment um, on our 150 megawatt peak summer system. We're actually uh, setting an annual goal of trying to foster two megawatts or more per year of rooftop solar development, which I think is a kind of a unique uh, partnership there. Um, we're also starting to see an increase in the number of electric vehicles that are connected to our system. And with a transportation electrification plan of our own, um, we are fostering the growth uh, of EVs as well. In fact, we're giving away level two chargers to any uh, consumer who wants one uh, with a full $650 rebate that covers the cost of the charger. And we're actually allowing them to finance through us all the installation charges as part of our charge at work and charge at home programs. And then we're supplementing that with working with our communities to install fast charging in parks and shopping centers and places in our area where we know people are, are moving around. So we definitely are seeing a growth of distributed energy resources and trying to foster those. Because as I mentioned at the open, you know, we can only get so far with adding bulk clean energy resources to our system before we really start to have to look at how we manage and, and, and modulate demand as well as supply of electricity in order to reach these 80, 90, 100% uh, clean energy goals that we all have. And DERs are important um, resources that allow us to fine tune the, the demand and the supply for electricity if we can, to, to Fred's title, to orchestrate them the right way with the right communications, the right controls, the right pricing mechanisms, uh, and, and through uh, a number of projects, that's what we're beginning to explore here at Holy Cross Energy. Thanks, Brian. Anna, let's hear what's happening in Austin. Yeah, so um, it, it's funny, I've, I, was, I was kind of preparing for this and attending a few other conferences and things this week, I kept coming across, you know, the term DER penetration. And it's one of those things where if you read a term over and over again, you kind of start to try and, you know, either you think like, huh, it's, that's not like, it sounds funny. It's a, it's a funny word. What does it actually mean? Um, and for some areas, it's very pertinent for Austin. I would say to me, DER penetration, I think comes across with this sort of implicit assumption that, um, there's some sort of risk involved to um, more traditional metrics of reliability um, and the necessity for voltage support or congestion management. I think um, we're in a really good place in Austin though, where I tend to see it as um, DER adoption. We have a very robust distribution grid. So the penetration thing, I think it, it tone wise doesn't quite fit where we are. We're very interested in, um, you know, before, you can run, you got to walk, um, understanding our landscape, understanding um, 
you know, before we get into controlling, which we've dabbled a little bit with Austin Shine, um, just having that visibility and being able to stack up all of the assets. In general, I think I have a pretty inclusive lens when it comes to DER. You know, I think going forward, there's going to continue to be these like off the shelf, you know, home energy management system type solutions. I tend to want to um, see that as a part of or connected to this whole idea of load management, flexible load assets. And so um, we're, you know, we're, we're looking at this from multiple ways for us from the DER adoption perspective. Um, again, yeah, I think that um, position wise, uh, I agree with a lot of what Brian said. However, a really interesting thing is we have a lot of new construction going on and we have a really cool um, green building arm. And so I think that'll be another way where we can sort of try to help mitigate, you know, even the management side of it. We can build in, um, you know, those efficiencies from the get go from that origin point. And so that'll just be like another sort of tool in our toolbox um, where we're, you know, trying to influence our grid in our territory and, um, you know, have building grid interactions that are favorable towards, you know, this grid modernization future state. Thanks, Anna. So Fred, you take a little bit different perspective, um, first being located in Europe, and, and I think you work in a number of different markets on these issues. Tell us what you're seeing and, and what are the parts of the world where you're seeing the most um, advancement in this question? Hey. Yeah, so indeed, what, what's interesting to look globally is the fact that, uh, you know, there's a, a whole range of flavors of, of the ERs, really. And if we gather the, you know, bulk renewables uh, also in the picture, uh, you know, any country is impacted. Any country sees this happening big time because of the ask of the general public, because of, you know, the regional or national CO2, uh, you know, reduction objectives. And so, so some countries, it starts a lot by, you know, bulk renewables, transmission level. Some countries, it starts really at the opposite with very small residential type DERs of any kind. And some, it starts kind of in the middle, right, with distribution mid-size type batteries, solar plants, wind farms. And, but ultimately, we really see the trend where, you know, everyone, every country, every region will get a little bit of everything, right? And so, so now what's interesting, I think also is the variety of these DRs in terms of uh, also the types of, uh, you know, contract that they are attached to, right? If a customer goes to a nearby store and, you know, buy oneself this, you know, PV kit, uh, you know, the, the main contract will be with uh, the grid operator really, and in terms of an interconnection contract. But more and more what we see is that there's a lot of creativity from the retailers, the aggregators into how they package these DRs into you know, very advanced services deals. And so that's about housing, you know, zero, zero emissions house. That's about you know, transportation and all the various types of packages that you have around electric vehicles, right? You've got the car and you've got the EV charger and now the same company is actually offering you, you know, the energy. A particular tariff that you'd have to, you know, to charge your EV, and so the creativity of all these, uh, you know, retailers and aggregators is just, you know, keeping increasing, and so that that's a very strong uh, trend really, and and so the contract that these DRs are attached to are, you know, more and more varied, and so and that's a very important point. Why am I stressing the contractual nature of DRs right up front? Is that in many cases the, you know, the DR does not belong to the utility, right? It might have been marketed by the utility and that's the examples that Brian were, were giving, saying, hey, we are ourselves, you know, marketing these DRs and pushing for, for DR adaption. But in many cases, uh, you know, anyway, there will be some other retailers, other aggregators. And so, you know, so giving for the grid operator to get a grasp and very solid grasp of what are the DRs which are around and what are not just the technical parameters, but also the contractual parameters, what you can and what you cannot do with this DR is absolutely uh, paramount. So a lot of diversity, a lot of growth, and, and notably on the front of, uh, you know, the contractual nature of DRs. Really. Thank you. So let's, I'm, I'm going to, um, 
focus on that word orchestration because one of the things as, as the industry talks about a clean energy future, we're anticipating a significant amount of intermittency to come in at the wholesale level through the integration of large scale wind and solar. At the same time, we're seeing more and more intermittency show up as we have more rooftop solar. We're seeing a bit of storage deployed at the distribution level. We have to, we've had demand management programs forever. And the idea of beginning to orchestrate this portfolio of resources is beginning to get some attention. Um, in, in many of the, the markets that I work in, candidly, the focus is on the penetration versus the adoption question. How can we increase penetration um, when it's not most customers' first choice? But in places where we're seeing that combination of resources at the wholesale and the retail level, the question then becomes, how do you begin to manage that? And, and Brian, I'm gonna start off with you again, because I know you all are doing some really interesting work here. You wanna get us started? Yeah, thanks, Kristen. That is the that is the question of the year. That is the question of the decade uh, as we go ahead, because I think um, you're, you're right. We, we are seeing a lot of variability of supply coming from the bulk power system as we transition to more variable renewable resources as our go-to for supply. But we need to match that with the flexibility of the delivery system and of the end uses. Um, we, about two years ago, entered into a partnership with our local Habitat for Humanity chapter um, our local school district and county government, and also the National Renewable Energy Laboratory on something called the Basalt Vista Affordable Housing Project. Uh, this was a, a project to create affordable housing for teachers and uh, community workers in a very high cost area of our service territory where housing was just out of reach. And uh, it was also in a community that had a very strong commitment to 100% clean energy and to climate action. And so the challenge that they laid before us uh, when they came to us for some assistance was how do we empower these houses in an all electric net zero emissions sort of way? And uh, our engineering team picked up the challenge and realized that if we uh, were, were clever, we could actually empower these uh, affordable housing units with a, a mix of distributed energy resources and use them as a feasibility study on our side to understand how to manage and control DERs in a way which provided value to the consumer, but also provided value to the grid. So each of these houses has an eight kilowatt rooftop solar PV system with smart inverters, uh, a lithium ion phosphate battery uh, in, the, in the, you know, the basement of the house, a heat pump water heater, an air source heat pump, and a level two EV charger so that all of the comfort, the function, the mobility, the lighting was provided with, with electricity. And we had each of these DERs outfit with a set of controls that allowed us to, in a very analog sort of way, send control signals and you know, prepare them to charge up in times of oversupply and to discharge back to the grid when we needed some local flexibility and in a very sort of manual way, we were able to understand how all of these DERs could be orchestrated uh, for the benefit of that consumer and for the grid. The consumer basically pays a fixed low monthly charge and they can use the energy however they like. And we get all the grid services that are provided by those DERs in an area where, where we have a you know, really rough go with the grid. So that showed the feasibility of us being able to manage a high penetration, high adoption DER world. Now what we're working on with some follow on is how do we develop the market platform and how do we develop the rate and the incentive structures so that all of the manual signaling and controlling that we did in the first phase of this project can now be done with automation and with intelligence uh, embedded in the end use and in the meter or the controller or even in the device itself so that we can actually send, as my friend and colleague at EPRI, Clark Gellings, years ago said, we can actually send prices to devices and the consumer and their devices can interact with us uh, at the retail market level and also potentially together at the wholesale market level uh, and the DER value streams can be fully realized. We think that's the key to taking us beyond our 70-70-30 goal 
to go all the way on this journey to 100%, which is where our communities want us to go. Thanks, Brian. Fred, I, I suspect you have some views on this. Do you want to jump in? Yeah, sure. So very interesting example, Brian. Uh, thanks a lot. Indeed, I mean, and, and what you're showing is, uh, I mean, shows that, uh, you know, there are different objectives, right, in the various stakeholders. And, and what is great is, is just like when you, what you are depicting is when you manage to, you know, find an operating manner that, that puts all the objectives together. But in the most general case, you know, at one given point in time, the transmission uh, system operator may want to shave peak, right? For an issue of system capacity. At the same time, the DSO distribution grid operator, he wants to actually consume more because he's got a lot of PV rooftops, which are generating a lot and creating a lot of, you know, backfeed voltage troubles, etc. And at the same time, the prosumer, well, frankly, he doesn't care, right? He wants his car charged, you know, as fast as possible, with, whatever be the, the time of the day. And so, so, so that's uh, one of the dimensions that we imply with this term orchestration indeed is saying, hey, how do you, you know, uh, reconcile, if you will, all these different uh, objectives, transmission, distribution, and ultimately the prosumer. And so part of that, and you touched on that uh, also is saying, hey, you know, th there has to be, a, a, again, a contractual nature into these exchanges. You evoke, you know, the prices to the devices and, and all the tariffs, et cetera. That's indeed essential uh, so that, you know, the prosumer or the retailer and aggregator who represents the, the prosumer, you know, they, they have their local optimum, if you will, of what they want to do so that the house indeed is zero emissions or so that, you know, the wear and tear of the battery that they invested in be, you know, minimum or so that, again, the car be used at its maximum uh, potential, et cetera. So they have their, their local prosumer-centric objective, if you will. And so if the grid wants to get something out of these DRs in terms of flexibility, it essentially means de-optimizing you know, the local optimum prosumer centric. So, so you need to compensate, you need to pay for that, right? So, so therefore all the tariff stuff you were evoking. And so we see a lot of different, uh, you know, regulatory regimes in terms of, uh, you know, how can this be done uh, in all these flexibility markets, regulation, uh, et cetera, which are tested throughout the globe. Uh, but that the, the core of that is, is really, uh, you know, boils down to, every DR being modeled as not just a technical object, but also, you know, an object that has some contractual attributes, some stuff you can do and some stuff you cannot do with it. And all this needs to replicate throughout all the systems, really. And that's another dimension of what we call orchestration is that when you pull the string, you know, it takes the geospatial, the planning to decide whether you can or cannot connect and what's the hosting capacity left to you, blah, blah, blah and then the distribution operations and the transmission operations too. So a lot of coordination throughout is also what we mean with this orchestration term. I'm gonna come back to you on the question on the contractual obligations there, because I think there's a lot to unpack there. Anna, you wanna talk about some of what Austin's doing here? Yeah, it's interesting. I, um, you know, Austin Shines had so many different layers that I've spoken about in the past. You know, we were, controlling a, a step beyond, you know, the manual uh, grid scale, uh, aggregated commercial and aggregated residential energy storage assets with a holistic value stacking distributed energy resource management system. And what we found, um, you know, with this holistic approach was uh, what you tend to run into in the real world is ancillary system underperformance. And, um, you know, be it just the day-to-day -day operations of, you know, you have alarms come up and uh, it, almost like um, kind of grain boundaries and as you're like hardening a material, like more and more pop up and they're kind of fighting each other. And um, so orchestration perfectly fits how on, on the very technical level um, that I do think is gonna be a barrier of, um, you know, having this be more and more represented on the grid. Um, in terms of speaking a little bit to the contractual piece, uh, for the commercial customers in Shine, we actually gave um, the aggregator the priority to act 
on, on their own algorithm on behalf of demand charge reduction for the customer. And then what would, whatever was left over, secondary, um, our DERMs could then take over. However, even with that prioritization and that sort of handing off of contractually and you know, with, with, the, with the controls and communications themselves, we, del- we, we did still find that you know, if we wanted to preemptively charge for a coincident peak, um, it in, I think, you know, a couple instances was very counter to them wanting to just discharge to, you know, shave their, shave their peak um, locally on site. And so when it comes to managing load, it is very much about um, to whose end, um, you know, the owner versus operator dilemma is something we do have a report on um, for Shine. But um, yeah, again, once you start to move away from the um, manual toggling and you do want to entrust the system to do that for you, a lot of other things then start to crop up. So um, ancillary system performances is gonna have to be something that um, we'll also need in terms of like creating benchmarking and metrics and things to evaluate system performance. I feel in general, battery performance is very individualized and we, we don't really have a good commonly understood grounding for, you know, system to system. Um, but then, you know, looking at those like ancillary pieces, those will also have to be sort of um, understood and better looked at more so that they aren't, you, you, you aren't having that uphill battle trying to adopt something that is more autonomous. Thanks for that. So I'm, I'm going to follow up on the, the contractual piece, um, because I think there are a couple of elements to it. One is what do you get paid for showing up at what time as a resource or reducing load on the system at a time when that matters. The other question, though, um, becomes for reliability purposes, when you have this mix of players potentially at the distribution system, we used to have a system that the, re- the reliability entity was always the integrated utility. And as these portfolios of resources continue to evolve, there may be many entities involved in the reliability of the grid. And I strongly suspect no one has solved this, but I would be interested to hear how you all are thinking about it. Fred, I'm going to start with you. Yeah, so so just to give an example, so, you know, the the... the the big battery uh, case, right? We see a lot of utilities uh, investing into some network size batteries, uh, you know, four megawatt, 10 megawatt, you know, 20, 100 megawatts, so big, big things. And, and these ones uh, obviously represent big investments. So you want to stack the, you know, the business cases to how you use this battery. And so many of them, they are actually uh, connected uh, at the distribution level, so obviously at the higher end of distribution level, and and the play that UTTs are doing there is saying, hey, uh, you know, I want to use this battery both for transmission level needs, but also for distribution level needs, right? And and it happens that that yes, I mean these batteries they are sizable enough that they are very important and can bring a lot of uh, nice and necessary services, uh, you know, for uh, the transmission level but still they are connected at distribution level, right? So they can render services at distribution, but also whenever transmission wants to use them, they want they need to check that, hey, they are not creating or worsening an issue that would exist at the distribution level, right? So you've got really the battery owner, you've got the transmission system operator, and you've got the distribution grid operator, and they all need to remain in sync. So how do you, you know, do some regulatory, some, some regular checks at distribution level, looking ahead for the next 30 minutes that, hey, you know, team lanes that could be respected, that, that if respected, you know, would be safe at distribution level, but, but then within the swim lanes for the next 30 minutes transmission, which is, you know, running the batteries at much higher frequency, you know, they can do whatever they want to solve for the, the frequency issues, et cetera. So these types of coordination. Now, what, what becomes more tricky is when, of course, the, uh, the battery belongs to a soft party aggregator and is here sitting you know, at an industrial site, for instance, as a backup power or you know, as part of a you know, wider tariff that, that the, the end consumer uh, you know, subscribe to. And so that's when you know, you, you've got some, uh, some contracts indeed that you know, can be very, very elaborate in terms of uh, you know, what you can and, and cannot do. And, Interesting things there is, is really that 
these loops into, uh, you know, from operations back to planning, right? Because a lot of these contracts, they, they are really there not just to, to help the, uh, you know, the grid to, to uh, solve for some of the problems that the DRs are actually creating, but they're also there to, uh, you know, help, you know, more renewables connect to the grid actually, right? And so there are some schemes in some regulatory regimes like adaptive network management, for instance, where, you know, we real time in a closed loop, uh, you know, curtail some renewables where, you know, coming to some, uh, you know, breaching some constraints on transmission grid or distribution grid. And, you know, if you first look at that saying, hey, yeah, wow, that's curtailment or renewables. So that, that's not something anyone wants to do, right? But yes, but in grids where you know the hosting capacity is very limited now, you know that's the only way you can actually connect these guys, right? So that's a win-win. Saying hey, you know, either you connect a traditional way uh, with a regular, you know, interconnection contract, but then you know I can connect you only you know next year, and that will be the cost, or I can, can connect you right now without an upgrade to the grid, but you accept that you know uh, that. I can curtail you from time to time whenever I, I, I'm coming to breach a constraint, right? So that's for the big ones. And now uh, there's a lot to say also on the, on the small ones, and I'll be quick here, but just to say that these contractual terms, if you will, when you're going down now to the LV level and very small DRs, right? And residential rooftop and residential EV chargers and stuff, these are obviously terms that should be very, uh, you know, very simple in terms of you know what you can and cannot do to the DR, like you've got two advance advance uh, two hours advance notice, or you can only dispatch this DR three hours uh, a day, or you know twice a week, etc. And so these need to be really uh, incarnated in the actual DR model, so that then you know you can manage this uh, contractual operational constraints in a way that be manageable and directly by the utility. So without the need, you know, to run the market always, but just, you know, be able directly to dispatch these DRs, you know, as long as, you know, your central system, ADMS or EMS knows about this contractual operational constraint, then the system abstracts these and just gives you the DR availability, which is the net in terms of the technical capabilities and the contractual limitations of all these DRs that, that, that are around. Right. Thank you for that. So it sounds like it's a combination of very detailed planning for the potential use of that system, as well as um, contractual agreements that underpin what's required at what time. Um, exactly. Yeah. And how are you all thinking about the reliability piece of managing this portfolio of resources? You know, a, a utility company really has one job, and that's to keep the lights on and to do so in a safe and affordable way. And I think that no matter what the grid architecture looks like, um, that's gonna remain the job of the utility to um, provide for that reliability, to make sure there are enough resources, to make sure that there's enough capacity available to serve the needs of, of, the, of the end users. And, and so with that in mind, I think what we are looking at doing is a slightly different approach to, to what, what Fred is describing. Um, we see DERs participating in our retail market the same way that we have generation resources and, and demand side resources participating in the wholesale market. And I think uh, today's decision by our Federal Energy Regulatory Commission to lay out rules on how distributed energy resources can participate in wholesale markets is only gonna accelerate that way of thinking. Um, we are the distribution system operator the end of the day as a distribution utility, we own some transmission and so on. But I think that um, as our markets evolve and we're seeing this in Europe and in Australia as well with DERs, the distribution system operator really has to coordinate and orchestrate all of the functions of these DERs. And in, in, in our sense, because the people that we serve are also part owners of our company as an electric cooperative, um, they are, they are utility assets by definition. Uh, and we engage them uh, in a way that is, you know, they are us and we are them. Uh, and so what we found is there's a number of different modalities for engagement contractually. There are some consumers that want to 
uh, have access to distributed energy resources, but by and large, they are fine with financing and procuring them through us with the idea that in exchange for that benefit, these are grid assets that they are hosting on their premise. And that by and large, we're using them in the majority of the time to support the needs of the broader system. There are consumers that are bringing their own devices to us that they own that they say, hey, if I give you this service, will you give me this payment? And so we have other programs like our peak time rewards program, or interestingly, a peak time program for extra consumption during times of day where we are uh, over in wind or over in solar. Um, we also have some consumers that say, look, this is my device. Um, I need it for my usage and here's my specifications. But beyond that, you are welcome to use it at any time so long as you provide me with a bill credit every month that I get whether you use it a lot or a little, right? And so we look at our rates and our programs and our tariffs with thinking through how do we engage our consumers in a way that encourages them to adopt DERs and provide them as grid assets that we can utilize to meet our one objective, which is to have enough reliability, enough resilience, enough capacity and resource adequacy to keep the lights on. Um, and that's our role as the, the coordinator, the orchestrator, the distribution system operator. And then we get the opportunity of working with all of our fellow DSOs to then provide resources up to the wholesale grid and to the transmission system operator. We don't presently have that construct here in the Intermountain West, but uh, a lot of us are advocating for that and we'll, we'll see how that goes. So you all are the conductor. Yeah, I, and, and I think that that's, that's going to be the utility role. Um, I think the utility will rely on aggregators and third parties that bundle uh, consumers together to provide values to that aggregator. Um, some consumers may want to participate individually, but I think at the end of the day, the one thing I know about the utility business model is we're going to be the ones that are going to be coordinating and managing the grid. Yeah, and we'll get the call when our lights are out. Yeah, we're, we're the one that get the call anyway, so why not, why not fulfill the purpose? So the, the next question actually came in from one of our um, participants. So if multiple entities are contributing to the reliability of the grid, which is what we're talking about with Brian's concept of being a primary orchestrator, ultimately holding um, reliability risk, shall we say, at that DSO level, how do utilities ensure DER data sharing between the entities is safe and secure? Or is that even the utility's job if it's third parties that are exchanging data? What are, you, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, Fred, you want to start? Yeah, so so two quick uh, reactions here. One, one uh, we see in all geographies, uh, TSOs and DSOs collaborating much more than they had in the past. They realize that, uh, yeah, whenever they want to, uh, you know, understand a problem that is caused by renewables or DRs or whenever they want to solve for it, uh, th there's something on the other side of the fence that they need to understand. Right. There are geographies where most of the energy now is fed directly at distribution level, right? The biggest share of the energy is fed directly at distribution instead of transmission. So, but still the TSO is in charge of frequency and balancing, right? So it's absolutely essential that he understands, you know, what's happening down there at distribution level, this types of scenario. So we see a lot more TSOs and DSOs sitting together. And, and when you pull the string, you know, uh, if you want to uh, coordinate yourselves in terms of the scheduling and control of these DRs, you need to then be in sync about the forecasting of what these DRs, you know, will provide in terms of generation and what will be the available storage, etc., and available flexibility in the coming hours. And then obviously bring the string further, you say, okay, we need to be in sync about, you know, what these DRs are, are about, you know, which DRs are, are there and what are their key parameters, right? And how can I you know, what's the monitoring right now, et cetera, et cetera. So from scheduling down to forecasting, down to, to the modeling. And so the ultimate uh, stage, which is actually the first one, is really the awareness about, you know, being in the loop, the utility being in the loop every time a DR is marketing and, and marketed and sold, right? And we see a lot of operators saying, hey, you know, yeah, I don't really see the pain yet or in some pockets of my grid. So, 
you know, I don't, I don't really know what the errors are there, but, but, but you know, I, I'm not impacted yet, right? And what we learned from front runners is saying, hey, you know, this is a bit of a tricky reasoning there, right? Because, uh, you know, the day you start to really feel the pain and have some strong challenges linked to DRs, right? You will not, you know, you, you'll turn back and, and, and look and say, hey, you know, I created a huge problem for myself. You know, I created a huge backlog of these devices. I don't know what they are, where they are, who they belong to. You know, how can I monitor them? How can I control them? What's the smart inverter? What's the local control modes that I can play with, et cetera, et cetera. So, so that really, uh, yeah, leads to, to uh, you know, the key lessons we hear from front runners, which is, you know, start today and, and start notably with just the grand homework of, you know, harvesting all the information about these DRs, you know, being in a loop. Thank you. Anna, thoughts on data sharing from the work at Austin? Yeah, I think that I would go a little bit back to the planning and contracting pieces. You know, we really wanted to investigate this idea of value stacking, and it's not so much that I'm disillusioned about, you know, the feasibility of that, but it is very much about, you know, being able to have accurate load forecasts to, again, project what's going to be there in what sort of buckets. Um, and instead of value stacking, I think I now am considering it to be value matching. And so if you know what you want to use, which asset for, then that can help define any sort of contractual obligations. We want to use thermostats primarily for this. It helps to you know, set some parameters and barriers as to um, then better, I think, shape and define uh, what those data requirements would be um, as, you know, utilities build this relationship with customers um, in a completely new way uh, to continue to like foster that trust in, in management, I think it'll be, it, it will just pay dividends to be able to do the forecasting of low, medium and high for each of these different um, DERs, kind of hone in on what fits best where, define that contractually and through other means, the programs you set up, the service offerings, and then you're not then in a position also of like, well, we don't really know what we need. So we'll just try to get all the data we can. And you're also overwhelming yourself. And there's no way there's, it's going to be even from a retention um, standpoint, from a just historical analysis, you know, like how is this, you know, how well is it performing? It's going to get trickier and trickier. So all of those steps, I think, feed into ultimately the question of, you know, really what is the data that you need for this type of resource? And then how is it best going to be used um, so that, neither party is really confused about, you know, how, how, how it's best being utilized in, in the way that they're allowing us to orchestrate. Excellent. 20 seconds. Kristen, Kristen <laughs> I think, I think Anna's point is super important. Uh, we, we operate on a kind of, what do we need to know and what's the minimum amount of data that needs to be exchanged. And because in many cases, our consumers are working with us to procure and install and maintain and realize value from the DERs, um, we're aware of them, to Fred's point, but we're also sitting down with the consumer straight away and saying, this is the data that we need in order to provide you with the value that you're asking for. This is how the data is going to be used. We're using APIs or other secure data methods. We're perhaps even not worried about the behavior of the individual DER itself but instead working through the aggregate effect on the net load at the meter uh, and then backhauling it on our system where we've already invested in the safe and secure transmission protocols. Um, in our Basalt Vista project, we were able to demonstrate that the controllers, which we're now working to get embedded into the meter can itself, the local controllers on those DERs could actually engage in a form of optimal power flow in real time behind the meter at the consumer side. So what we basically provided as the grid operator to the consumer was the desired net load shape. And then the DERs kind of orchestrated amongst themselves to say, well, if I don't have enough coming from the grid, if I don't have anything coming from the grid, then I'm gonna pull from the battery to support this use. And I'm actually gonna de-emphasize some of these non-critical uses so that I have the ability to ride through an outage or a winter storm or something like that. And I think as we, mature in our ability to manage and orchestrate with data, we'll be able to realize that we don't need to know what every DER 
is doing at every given time. What we need to know as the grid operator is the aggregate effect of those DERs at the exchange point. And to Fred's point, that's where the DSOs and the TSOs operate is, what's the net effect? What are the grid services that I need at that exchange point? If you take that model and now abstract it one layer down between the DSO and the prosumer, I think you've got a workable model that solves a lot of the data volume as well as security issues. Thank you so much. Um, so we are at and just slightly over time. Thank you very much, all of you for putting the time in today. I really appreciate your remarks and I'm gonna turn it back over to Aaron.